Hi everybody, I'm Wendy Murdoch and this is Webinars with Wendy. I've been doing a series of webinars during the pandemic to visit with friends, learn something, and just uh, spend an hour that's like a, like a nice chat with somebody to kind of take your mind off of the everyday things that are going on. I'm actually finding that, that like my life this morning was so hectic. I had so many things going on, but then I get to sit down and have an hour of time with someone that I really am looking forward to talking to and it grounds me. So I don't know about you, but I find the webinars incredibly peaceful. It settles me. It's an hour. I know I can do nothing else but be here with my guest and learn something and have a good time. So I hope that that's working the same way for you in this very hectic world that we're living in right now. Um, just remember, if you subscribe to the Surefoot Ecoin YouTube channel, every time we put up a video, you'll get a notification of when the webinars have gone up. I don't always get them up um, the, the same day, depending on what happens with my life after the webinar, um, but I do try to get them up the same day. So if it's not up there right away, please be a little patient. We'll get it up there. Today, my guest is Amy Lissat. I have known Amy. Well, oh, we're going to have to dive back, Amy. Yeah. How long have I known you? Well, before Surefoot. That's um, right. Quite a while before Surefoot. Sure, the mule standing on the therapads that yeah, well, you started with, and you know that obviously didn't work because they tear up so easy. So. Yes, yeah, that was. I started Surefoot in 2012, and we did videos with Emily Kitching prior to that. So I've known you for a long time. We're just going to say that. Um, and every time I go out to Colorado to Luann Goodyear's place, uh, Last Resort Ranch, um, Amy comes along. She actually was there for a while. And we've done fun things like filming segments for Eclectic Horseman's Gazette um, uh, video magazine. And, um, you know, and then, of course, with Surefoot, Amy was there uh, pretty much from the beginning because I started in May and I was at Luann's. And usually I went and go in June and July, somewhere yeah. in there. I brought you, bought your prototypes that were all yellow. Oh yeah. Okay. So you go way back. <laughs> so, um, so anyway, I'm so glad to get a chance to talk to Amy today because she is a three hoof sure foot practitioner, meaning that she can do clinics and demos and uh, work with individuals. Um, but I'll let her tell you a little bit about her story uh, in a moment, but she's been doing some really interesting work working along with a veterinarian. So I'm very curious to hear how this is going and to see if it isn't a model that we can think of working with other veterinarians around the country um, where Surefoot and the veterinarians uh, uh, prescriptions for rehab go hand in hand and we can really help these horses. So welcome, Amy. Thanks for coming on the show. I know we had to reschedule you last time because we, we had trouble getting the Zoom thing to work, but we got it down today. Thank you. Yay, and thanks for having me. I appreciate it so much. And uh, like Wendy said, I met her uh, many years ago, and mine was out of self-preservation because I'd had several injuries and multiple surgeries, and I'd heard from Luann that Wendy could help me uh, improve my horsemanship, even though I was full of hardware. And so that's how I met. And then... Um, because of Wendy, I've been able to stay horseback. I'm in my 60s now, and I'm still training, still teaching, still giving clinics. And I um, am forever grateful to her for helping me with uh, everything that she's shown me over the years. And oh, thank you so the much. Sure foot is can, a can you just see if you can turn your mic up a tiny bit more since somebody said that uh, you're a little bit faint? And we want to hear every word you have to say. Okay. Oh, better. Is so, that better? Yeah. So, Amy, like, you, you've lived in Colorado all your life, right? No, I grew up in Wyoming on a big ranch up there, a cow-calf operation that my folks owned. And oh. um, it was an anomaly that I grew up riding Arabian horses. They, um, my folks, my dad started raising Arabians in 1958. And, wow. Wow. Uh, yeah, and so we did all of our ranch work with Arabians up there, and uh, I met Ray Hunt, who is, uh, my dad is my inspiration and, and instilled the passion for horses in me, but Ray Hunt was the one that inspired my, to further my horsemanship, and so I met him in Wyoming. We moved to Colorado in the uh, late 80s when uh, our 
old our daughter Liz was about two. So, but so we've been down here a long time. Right. So, um, when who's the woman that wasn't she in Arizona that had a lot to do with bringing Arabians over to the United States? Um, yeah, that was Basie Tankersley. Thank you. About our Arabians there. Yep. And, right. Um, the fellow that uh, helped her import a bunch of Arabians. Uh, his name was Dr. Bill Munson, and my dad and Doc Munson and another fellow named Venus Kilmer were, uh, v uh, Doc was in Nebraska, Venus and my dad were in Wyoming, and they organized and started the Wyoming Arabian Horse Association. My dad was the first president. Um, but a lot of the bloodlines that my dad and Venus had were instrumental through Doc and Basie Tankersley, the Crabbit Arabian bloodlines. Wow. So, so, so your dad was really instrumental in the Arabian horse really taking off here in the United States. Yes. Yeah. He wow. was one of the, one of the, we call, I called it the old guard, the guys that really got it started. And um, he was, you know, like I said, it was an anomaly to have Arabians solely on the ranch. And did he did he ever say why he wanted Arabians versus quarter horses? They go all day. Oh, he had to switch horses, and his horses were big. In fact, the gelding that I competed um, on in competitive trail riding through NATRC was 16 hands, and he had a size two front shoe, a nine inch circumference cannonball, and he was huge. Wow. And so uh, these guys could, dad's horses would just go all day. And we roped um, to Dr. Cattle and Brand and, and um, gather all day. Sometimes we'd leave the barn at eight o'clock and wouldn't get home till nine o'clock at night. And we still had a lot of horse left. So, um, and then we got into competitive trail riding. He had horses that ended up qualifying for the World Cup in endurance racing too. So he, he his horses. I were, never knew this about you. This is this is why I love my webinars. Yeah. <laughs> that well, is they so were, cool. They, were tough. they weren't the the stereotypical Arabians that you see in the show ring, that's for sure. Yeah, you know it's uh like a lot of the old stock, I think of the Morgans in particular. And when I was a kid I I um used to live in New England and so we you know Morgan horses were very sturdy about 15 hands solid bones you know big head nice body and uh -huh. um, you know we've changed both the Arabians and the Morgans now to be more of a showy type um, which is kind of for me uh, a bit sad because that solid you know Morgan, Justin Morgan, the whole idea was you could ride it and you could drive and you could work the fields. And so it had to be a really sturdy, solid beast, which it was. They're great. And I showed um, Morgans at uh, my alma mater, the University of New Hampshire, because they bred Morgans there. Um, and it's the same thing that we, we see have, have seen over the past 40 years. Right. <laughs> um, a big shift in the breeding and um, we've lost some of the characteristics that were really why we, we gravitated to those breeds um, right. but there's there's still pockets right there's still pockets where they're breeding that type of arabian yeah, i i still have friends i have a friend well doc munson's grandson is still raising those good solid bloodlines and um good solid big boned big bodied horses that can do a job but they're they're lovely to look at too so right um, yeah. Right. And not, not the flighty, you know, a, a lot of people, their impression of Arabs is flighty, but that's really right. not, I mean. And I blame that on the way they're raised, the yeah. way they're handled, because the ones that we've worked with, um, my husband and I have been training for, oh goodness, 50 years I have been, because um, I trained for my dad and my husband 30. And so we've, ridden thousands of horses over the years and the Arabians that come in that have that stereotypical oh my gosh I got to leave the country flight uh, response when you approach them in a different way they they change they they get well, so much cool. better so, it's yeah, really cool yeah yeah, yeah. cool yeah. all right so so we met some time ago and um yeah you've had a lot of injuries so um and I, I've forgotten, you know, because you're doing so much better, actually. Um, right. And people but, look at me and go, really? Yeah. yeah. And I say, oh, yeah, I've got hardware in my back and my neck and... Uh, my and your feet. foot? Don't you? Yeah. Both feet. 
I've got fusions there and now in my arm that we, I broke last summer. <laughs> and uh, yeah. <laughs> yeah, so that is a story. We won't uh, go there, okay? <laughs> <laughs> but uh, yeah, and um, lack of mobility and all of the things I do now that Wendy has helped me with over the years with Feldenkrais and balanced riding have just changed myself and my horses have gotten so much better. Just so great. Yeah, yeah. Well, I really appreciate you saying that. Um, but the thing that has been so interesting is you were there at the beginning of Surefoot and you've seen the evolution of Surefoot. But um, when we were there last summer, let's see, was it two years ago when I started doing the practitioner trainings? I can't remember. Or was it only last summer we did the first one? Anyway, um, we did a practitioner training and, and it was obvious that Amy's worked with Surefoot from the beginning and so we didn't need to go through this the other steps with her because she has such a solid understanding of it and um, is doing such great work and so that was one of the things for me that was is so exciting to see some of the folks that have been around from the beginning of the origin of this technique and see how they've taken it and embodied it and really understand the principles behind it um, and now the work that you're doing. Um, so tell people a little bit about what, how you're using Surefoot today and, and who you're working with. Okay. So um, like Wendy said, I started uh, from the very beginning. I um, had started using it with the, our training horses uh, and I saw, I saw a huge difference in the responses I got and how much quicker the horses would let down um, and how much less work I had to do to get a calmer response from them because the surefoot pads did a lot of that work for me. And then um, I, it, I think it was last year, Wendy, that uh, because I, I did the practitioner class and then I missed out on the yeah <laughs> the writing part because she had another uh, <laughs> yeah and. Um, you had talked to Susie and I and explained to us what you were going to do with us. <laughs> and, <laughs> and then uh, it, uh, I, I have a, an amazing veterinarian, Dr. Marianne Marshall Gibson out here in Loveland that I've been working with. And she is an, um, just an incredible diagnostician on lameness issues. And so I have been using her for my personal horses and some of my clients' horses to come in and she does acupuncture, chiropractic and massage. And uh, we, she, she saw me one day using the Surefoot pads on a horse of mine that had foundered. And she said, tell me about those, what are you doing? And I did and she said, oh, I think Dr. King at CSU is using those can you tell me more? And so she and I got into a big long discussion about um, the Surefoot pads and how I had noticed with my personal horses, my clients' horses, the, the changes. And, and you know, the, this horse that had foundered um, was incredibly sore, but with the rehab I was doing with the Surefoot, he came back so fast and she was amazed and so now we collaborate she refers her patients to me as part of the rehab with the surefoot now she has a whole a collaboration of um uh rehab exercises that she has people doing and i incorporate the surefoot pad into that with all of these patients and it's just I've had some fails, don't get me wrong. We've, you know, there's some that absolutely she and I cannot fix, um, but um, the, the successes have been outweighed far more than the fails that we've had, so. Yeah, and you know, nothing is 100%, and if a horse, no. like a person, you know, there's a, when you can't recover, then you obviously, it's time, but um, so tell us, she, so she's a, a, a veterinarian. She goes out, she diagnoses the problem with the horse. Yes. And then she refers the client to you. Yes. And I go out and she sends me all of their workup 
and all the diagnostics and all of the other uh, rehab that she's uh, prescribed for the horses. And then I um, go out and meet the horse and I have them uh, walk the horse back and forth and then circle if they're able to. I don't do more than, than I feel like the horse is physically able to do. And then I start putting them on the pads and seeing uh, which ones that they are accepting of and which ones they're not. And then I, I'll wait a week and we go back and do it again. And I'll do it three or four times. And then um, we decide, you know, which pads are going to fit into the protocol that Dr. Mariana set up for their rehab and go from there. And then I follow up and I follow up and I follow up, make sure everything's going okay. And um, that we don't need to change pads if they're still accepting of the ones that we're working with, um, to, with, with their rehab back. So that's, that's how we've been doing it so far. And then ha does the doctor come in say every four weeks and reassess to see how the horse is progressing? Yeah, yes, she does because the, the clients, the ones that are committed to the horse's rehab, um, they, she follows up once a month at least um with with to see how they're doing because they'll have her have them have her come back in and do more chiropractic or acupuncture or whatever right. they is so she comes in with, and does her skill set and then in the meantime so you're seeing these horses once a week for about three to four weeks then to assess how it's going and so what kinds of um what kinds of issues are you are you seeing what what are you what kind of issues are you being referred for so, founder i've done a couple of those i've had a lot of ligament injuries and i've had um, a sweeney shoulder oh. i've had a broken cannon bone which was one of my fails but it was too far gone by the time um, dr mariana and i got involved with snow bringing it back um i've had um uh, a torn glute and uh I've had, oh, kissing spine. I've had a, two or three of those now. And wow. man, oh man, success, success with the kissing spine and the rehab. It was, it's just amazing. I, I'm just thrilled with that because, wow. you know, that could be a, a no ride or, you know, right. and there's so a life changer for a lot of horses. And yeah. so, um, what, so she's, I've, She's coming in and doing chiropractic, acupuncture, massage. You're coming in and doing surf foot. And then is the owner doing things in between these visits? Like, are they? They're doing the, the rehab. With, we'll do sternal lifts and butt tucks and over the poles, depending on, you know, each injury. Um, stretches, carrot stretches, um, um, all kinds of those type of things. And um, with the, like, the kissing spine, it was a weight loss and they needed to lose weight um she'll draw blood some of them have been metabolic so change of diet um and lots of exercise getting horses to come back and just yeah. like us where yeah. you know if we've got an injury if you sit in your chair it's not going to help no. so we say we say in the rehab world motion is lotion and yeah. moving is best to do that and the Surefoot pads um, have been an amazing addition to increasing the percentage of recoveries. And I, I like I said, I've I've just been doing this for about a year and a half with Dr. Marianne. Well, two years now with Dr. Marianne, and it's it's uh, it's just what gets me out of bed in the morning. The it's so exciting because you know th this is actually one of the roles that I want the surefoot practitioners to be in is in that supporting role to the client and helping interface between the veterinarian and the diagnostics and the treatment plan and being a part of that. So does she also involve a farrier or a trimmer? In oh yeah, because we have multiple sets of x-rays. Um, so the farrier is involved with all of that. And um, so we have, you know, depending on the injury, like for example, the, um, the founder, the uh, laminatic horses, there's injuries to the foot. And so the x-rays determine the angles and it'll determine, help me determine which pads to use. Because yeah. if I use the slants, 
and it's too much, then I, you know, I can tell by seeing the x-rays now and under her guidance, always under my vet's guidance, um, right. make sure that um, I'm not adding to the injury by doing too much. So. You know, this is, the, but it, this is so great because this is really where I see that Surefoot can be so beneficial to so many horses because it's not like you can have the veterinarian come every day and oh. the, the client needs, um, needs some support, needs somebody there to be able to talk to and figure out and help and support. And so the, the idea here is that you're filling that role, that bridge between the veterinary exam and the diagnostics and the prescription right. and the client who, you know, I mean, I don't know about you, but how many times can you remember like something happened to your horse? And even though you know all this knowledge, you stand there and look at your horse and go, uh, I don't, I don't, you know, I mean, when it's our own horses, it's so much harder to yeah. be able to do what we can do for other other people's horses. I'm sure you've found that many times. Yeah, because, uh, you know, even though I'm, I'm very emotional anyway with the horses, uh, it's less emotional for me because I don't have that attachment uh, right. like the owners do. And so I can be a little more subjective of, of things. So, objective, yeah. Um, yeah. But uh, the surefoot pads, even like with uh, Charlie, the little Arabian that had broken his cannon bone, um, it didn't help him with his recovery, but it gives him comfort. It takes some pressure off of that area that he's, that hurts so bad. And so um, he just, I, it, it's just amazing how, and those were the softs that we put him on that it, it yeah. gave him comfort and you could see him just kind of let down and go, oh, yay. Right, for um, those moments. Now we have some video. Should we, yeah. should we uh, pop up some sure. video here? Okay. Um, because you sent me some video in advance. Hang on, I'm just, before I share that, I'm gonna just kind of uh, pull one up so it's up on the screen already, then you don't have to watch me going through my machinations. There we go. Um, now I can screen share. So, um, uh, Amy sent these to me ahead of time because she's on satellite internet and we weren't sure how well her internet was going to hold, which better today than when we did our test, but that's why I have them. So they're in some random order because that's, they just came through. Um, <laughs> and so I'll just go ahead and play this and then you can talk about this horse. Okay, this is Whiskey and he is lame on both fronts and is diagnosed with navicular, which is another real common one we've been working with, one I forgot to mention. And so I will do um, some video in the beginning to see how his feet are landing. And so I know... Um, yeah, that's really interesting. Not, you can see how he's landing on the medial side there and then rolling yeah, to the outside. Yes, yeah. so but I you, know how to help him. And yeah. Um, and may I also say that you can see, I'm just going to take this back a second. If you watch, there there used to be a really great video called The Thoroughbred, which is not available anymore, but they talked about how to recognize a sore racehorse. And what you can see here with this horse is just watch how he uses his head and neck to avoid yes. putting load on his front foot. So he's raising his head and neck as his foot is landing to take the weight off of the foot rather than nodding yeah. downward. Yeah. Yeah. So Whiskey was, and still is, um, one of my clients. They, um, uh, we have him on all the pads. In fact, the horse in the background, the Appaloosa back there is now on the pads. And they, their daughter bought a horse and, and we have her on the pads now too because she, um, when they did the vet check, was really sore in her back. And so um, clients that not only use them for, um, you know, the rehab like we are with whiskey, but for just gen oh, general um, comfort for their, you know, for their riding horse, personal horses. So, and I think that and it's a, a really good point though, that you don't have to have a problem to use Surefoot. No, mm -mm. no you don't. Um, because every horse that comes into training now for us automatically put them on the Surefoot pads and we can see from day one, when they come in, put them on the pads, and some of them don't want to be on them, and that's okay. Um, eventually, they do, um, but we can see 
what's going to show up in the riding by putting them on the pads. It's pretty, pretty cool. <laughs> pretty cool. You know, stuff. I remember you telling me about a horse and this is going back a ways, right? But you got a horse in for training that had buck everybody else off. Yeah. And, and, you and this is where my husband who is, was a, yeah, this is voodoo. I don't, <laughs> I don't think it works, <laughs> you know, and he's working alongside me. So, but anyway, until this horse and this big gray quarter horse gilding had come in and he bucked his owner off and bucked the trainers off. And so we get him and of course, by then he's got his habit of bucking and we did what we need to do. And with the, our horsemanship pieces of this business and every time my husband would get on and that horse was just tight and his tail was clamped and his back was like this and and one day I said would you let me just put him on the pads let's just try it and um we did put him on the pads and I've got a, one of he's on one of the videos he's the oh. one that yeah okay so anyway. one of the, the gray horse then I'll go look for that gray. one well, there's two, there's quite a few grays, but um, oh. he's the darker gray. And he, uh, that's what changed my horse's mind. He is now a surefoot believer because that horse that's never cool. offered to do that again. He got on those pads and I tell you what, that horse rocked back and forth. I don't know if you could feel it out in Virginia, but he was rocking the earth. <laughs> way <it's okay. laughs> but he, uh, it changed him and we put him on the pads every day after that he loved them never bucked again so that was a huge success story in the training aspect of it so and he was so tight in his muscles and he softened and um it was just amazing because i'd had dr marianne come out and check him and he was just tight as a drum you could have bounced pennies off his back he was so tight and just one session with her and then the surefoot pads and his muscles softened. He was less tense emotionally and physically he was, became a horse again. It was, it was so cool. Yeah. Cause I remember you telling me that story and it convinced your husband that maybe there was something here, yeah. was something in this. Finally. Yeah, Cause yeah. I've been working with Sherfoot for, for about four years. Oh really? That long before yeah. that happened? I didn't yeah. realize that long. All right. Yeah. I, I can only find one gray horse. It's an older gray horse. Uh, I don't know. Oh, that's not her. Darn it. Yeah. Let me see. Yeah. Maybe you have that or at least a photo. That would be great. Let me see here. Um, but this is one of the things that, you know, most people think of Surefoot and um, as a relaxation, that sort of thing, but it really can be used in training. And that's one of the things that Amy has done such a good job of is incorporating the surefoot pads with the horses in training. And yeah, I think she'd probably agree with me that one of the things that happens is the horses suddenly look at you and go, oh, there's something in it for me. Yeah. And yeah. when they realize this, they, yeah, go yeah, ahead. they don't think you're the enemy anymore. Right. They, yeah. Because yeah. you're getting a lot of horses that need retraining, really. You're not really getting horses that need training they've been they've been trained maybe not the best way and so they're coming in for for you know a redo and those horses now already are suspicious they have habits they're uncertain they're like oh yeah another one you know um it's like kind of being in school and having a bunch of bad teachers and you're you right. go into the class and you're like oh no it's gonna be another bad teacher i can remember my history well, to this day yeah, and, and, and mary who's watching um had sent her horse out here from Oregon to have us work. We actually raised the mare and Mary bought her from us. And uh, uh, Mary tried to get her started out there and it didn't go well. So she sent her out here and we started putting her on the pads and helping her a little bit and then sent her off to some young people down south of here that um, because we're in her 60s, I promised my family I wouldn't start colts anymore. So anyway. Um, understandable too <laughs> we, even we when they're good it. something can happen you know it's like it's uh well, and tom dorrance would say you know the colts are still quick and when he was older tom dorrance would say the colts are still quick and i'm not mm, so yeah. yeah and uh anyway so we sent her down south to work with this young couple who are also amazing and um 
I noticed with the pads, she was much, much better. And all we did was put her on the pads a little bit. But she got where she trusted the human again, where as before she was like, I don't think you have much to offer me. Right. And pads changed her mind where she That's got so cool. Kind of like this again. It was, yeah. We were okay. <laughs> so. That's great. Were you able to find a picture of that gray horse or should oh, I just well, show no, another I video? Don't know what happened to that, okay. So. Well, I'm going to, I'll just pull up another video. We're just, it's a crapshoot. Okay. We're just going to see what I get here. Uh, oh, not, uh, well, sure, we'll do this. Horse. We'll do this one, this horse here. Yeah. And he has EPM. Oh, okay. And, and it's, uh, he was at CSU. She spent about $7,000 trying to diagnose this EPM. And his, uh, this was the first pad we put him on was the physio introductory and his responses were incredible wow he, um this is so interesting to watch it looks like he might have just blown his nose just before you started or if not look at that that wrinkle in the nostril in the lips he flared him and uh so this was one with the epm that we have and still are working on he's still a little wobbly in his hind end but not bad i mean he was so bad that he was dragging his hind feet and now he's uh able to go over the raised cavalettis and not stumble. oh wow so, you know and this is really interesting i saw this when it went at normal speed but you can see him yawning and it actually looks like it gets stuck right because mm -hmm. you can see he's opened his mouth and since we just had um catherine wyckoff yesterday talking about the va the vagal trigeminal nerves that are up here and we had um jillian crimebring talking about the atlanta occipital and the o oh, you can almost see where he he appears to be stuck right there he's trying to let something go he's trying to yawn but you see how it doesn't complete there and you can no. see that shift in the pool he was in desperate need of an adjustment to um help some of that turn loose not not only with the pads but um with some manual adjustments absolutely well. yeah and that's where that that you know it's the the using the combination of things but um there's been a number of horses with epm that have really been helped and i can remember very early on uh someone uh, emailing me that her horse had he had been treated but wasn't able to perform and then she used surefoot and he was back to showing second level in dressage so th that's really cool so how long have you been working with that horse well you could see by the the pictures that was this winter it was in february and um covid kind of messed us up a little bit getting together but um we've been working with him off and on since then so we're back to working with him but there was a gap in there so and he did digress without um he did digress he did um because she was she was an rn and oh. she just didn't have time to work with them right when it's but that brings up a it brings up a really good point that you know people always say well how long do i need to do this with my horse or how how many sessions is there going to be a change and you know, there's no, nothing set in stone. There's no rules about that. Um, I'm sure you've seen and I've seen one session and like a horse is so completely different and can hang on to that change. And then other horses, uh, six months, even a year, I have one that's going on, what, three years now, um, in terms of making lasting, long-term, permanent change. Right. And there's not, so there's no set rules on that. It's really individual and depending on what, what the situation is what's going on with the horse you know does he have epm have you have you gotten to the root cause of if there's a problem um how long has it been going on absolutely i mean does it already been done the 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 biggest part is catching some of this stuff early like the my horse that was laminatic we caught him really early yeah. and we're able to um even the farrier is saying oh my gosh he's he uh He's almost back. I mean, there's still some rotation, but he's almost back. His hoof health is so much better. So Right. And that so that's true of so many things. You know, if we can catch it early yeah. enough, um, it's much more reversible. And so there's no, 
there's no single answer for how long is it going to take before you know I see an improvement in my horse or that it sticks and so I think you know that's one of the things to keep in mind when using Surefoot is is as Tracy Vroom I had Tracy Vroom on this week and she was really talking about being very present um, without yeah. expectations of fixing anything because the minute we are in the mindset of fixing something we're not present with what's really in front of us and so we we don't make good choices then you know we're too not in the moment right there are too many distractions and I tell my clients I said if you expect your horse to be all in you've got to be all in and you mm -hmm. need to leave your cell phone in your car and you need to be aware of what they're telling you because the horse is so keen on body language and if you're distracted then you wonder why they're not with you yeah. Um, and, you know, and, you just explained to me why I don't have pictures of horses when I'm first starting with the pads because I'm not picking up my phone. I'm too busy engaged with the horse. Uh, and, and that's me too. And and a lot of times I'm doing it by myself. Yeah. Um, and so it's really really hard. And so I've I've missed some incredible moments. Yeah. But I had to be there. I couldn't be distracted by. Oh wait a minute. I gotta take a picture. Yeah. So, um i've i've done my best with some of the horses that i've had especially if the owner's there and i can say is it okay and i always ask if i record or take pictures working on my um you know my case studies so and i just like to see later on i like the beginning and then as we progress are we actually making any progress and i mm. need to have that um documented yeah, but it but it is true that I you know we tend to be so present in the beginning that we're not picking up our phones, which is a which is really good. But then you know like how many times do I not have a picture on just of course on one pad because by the time they're on four pads I can step back and oh yeah I can take a picture now right <laughs> all right I'm gonna pull up another video let's see what we got here oh this one uh, whoop, not that one you can go away are you seeing the horse in the blanket yes I am. okay. All right, if you are, everybody is, because Zoom doesn't always track when you make a, uh, a change of scene, if you will. So this horse now, he's on hard slants behind and... Uh, yes. The old, those are the old pads in front. Yes, they are. Because <laughs> um, I'd lent out some of my other, other pads and... So those are actually firm in front, but they're yellow topped, which means that they were made over four years ago and they're still in use. Yeah, right, exactly. And so um, <clears throat> this horse is, had had a, a severe ligament injury on front and because of that, he had developed uh, some stiffness and challenges in his hind. And so we, um, again, with Dr. Marianne's guidance, um, I went out to, uh, assessed and this horse is one that just absolutely loved the pad so much that i actually had to take him off of him in the beginning because i didn't want to make him more sore um so um so he because he'd want to get on them and stay and i've i have found through bad experience that letting them stay on them the first time too long uh, exacerbates things pretty badly. So yep. um, uh, with a horse that I'm rehabbing back, I, even the horses that come in for training, I'm very particular about them not staying on the pads too long that first day. So um, um, Amy, I'm going to let you talk about that a little more while I get my charger for my battery because it's dropping rapidly and I don't want to lose it. So keep okay. going. <laughs> okay. So I was, I was trying to find the paperwork on him, but he um, was a jumper and um uh, he's a registered paint gelding he's about 16 one and he and i'm not finding the his paperwork but he um is now back to low jumping um you know two and a half feet is all but he two six um but it, he's back which and this was two years ago that we I did this with with him. His name is Moose, and uh, um, so this was one of our success stories with okay, I'm back. rehabbing a ligament injury. Which those those seem to 
um, well, I shouldn't say that. I have, I've had a lot of success with the deep flexor uh, tendon injuries, and um, he's one of the the proofs in the in that. Along with along with Dr. Marianne, I'm not taking credit for this. And, well, and the and the horse too, because or the and the owner of the horse because they were very consistent about um, putting him on the pads. They ordered the pads. We you know, and they were consistent about his. Uh, rehab work. And I think one of the important things, especially with tendon and ligament injuries, is you really have to have that diagnosis because if you use too unstable a surface too soon, you can actually make things worse. Um, yeah, so you can. Absolutely. And, and the hind end issue, I, I, Dr. Mary and I both felt that it was from um, compensation. And so he was just... Yeah putting too much um, pressure on the hind and anyway with the rehab he came back to some low level jumping which is great oh that's that's fun. Yeah. yeah yeah it's so nice when you can see the horses go back to the to a job that they can do and the owners are happy and it's just you know um working with horses isn't always easy as you know but it's those wonderful successes that keep us going i think it's uh keep, keep me going um because this is a hard gig uh, you know, it's yeah. uh, not for the weak of heart. It's a lot of work. It's physically demanding, um, emotionally demanding, and but these success stories really kind of keep me chugging yeah. along. So, and you ha you have to be if you're going to rehab a horse, you have to be all in. You have to be all in until the till to see what's going to happen, and it's not like it's going to resolve itself yeah. in two weeks. And you can pretty much tell from day one. Um, which of the owners are going to be all in to, to stick with you and which ones are going, mm, this sounds yeah. like a lot of work. Yeah. <laughs> like uh, so we've got a question uh, from somebody. It says, my six-year-old thoroughbred has weak stifles, long straight hind legs, sensitive back, and glutes. In five months, I'm five months into rehab post arthroscopy on the left stifle from torn cartilage, and now he seems lame on the right or possibly just weak. How can pads help him? Well, one you know, without seeing it, x-rays or anything, they, they'll give him some relief and get him to uh, get changes in his, remapping his brain so that he doesn't think that he's um, feeling so much discomfort all the time. And not that he's gonna make his injury worse if he doesn't feel the pain, but he's it's gonna give him more comfort so he's not, um, continuing to limp. So we develop a habit and I'm guilty of that mm -hmm. when I've had injuries, um, you know, where you limp or you, or you, you know, carry yourself like this and it becomes a habit. And so thank goodness for Wendy, I've learned to remap, do brain remapping so that my right side thinks that, that feels as good as the left side. And that's the, a lot of what these uh, surefoot pads do as far as you know remapping the brain and helping them learn that it's going to be okay so so one of the things that um there's a great book called explain pain for people by david butler who's a research scientist uh, in australia and th there his his group noe group noi group uh, dot com is researching chronic pain and and in the end it comes down to it's all in your head now i know that seems like a simple answer but this is where we perceive and horses are the same way. If they've been in pain for a long time, if you have been in pain for a long time and you've forgotten what it's like not to be in pain, you, there's nothing to grab a hold of. And so right. if, if nothing else, Surefoot can help horses by alleviating a, a certain amount of pain or resetting the proprioceptors, which have, um, proprioceptors are, tell us where we are in space, but they can get hijacked to become what's called nociceptors, which is pain receptors. So your proprioceptors, when they become pain receptors, your nervous system is reporting pain instead of where am I in space? And so with surefoot pads, surefoot can reset the proprioceptors, or that's our assumption because it's what we see, 
can reset those proprioceptors back to proprioceptors instead of pain receptors so that we can figure out where we are in space and then that decreases pain and also grounds us, makes us more secure, calms us down, triggers the parasympathetic nervous system, releases brain chemicals evidenced by um, the ex facial expressions that we see and also Dr. Stephen Peter's work. And so it, you know, if nothing else, if we can break that pain cycle for a little while so that you suddenly realize, wow, I don't have to feel this way all the time, you can start the nervous system into another pattern. Yeah. And, and so it's worth a try. I mean, it's the kind of thing that, you know, you're not going to, as long as you're that far down the road in rehab, I would think that the, the, the certain things are either in process or not progressing. Um, mm -hmm. Check with your vet. Uh, of yeah. course, um, yeah. but uh, and, and start with a half physiopad or a physiopad. Yeah. yeah, and that's always my go-to is, you know, for if the horse is lame, I need uh, a diagnos a, a diagnosis from the vet and some X-rays or something from the vet before I proceed because there's too much liability in my case if I go in with all guns blazing and try to fix it on my own. So. Um, so, you know, every horse I have, my, from my old guys to my young guys, I start with the physio pads because they're so, they're, they're benign enough that you're not going to create any more problems with them. And so she's just asking, um, she has a few sets of pads, the physio pads, slants and firms, start with the physio pad, start yeah. with the, the leg that seems to have the least discomfort or pain, um, mm -hmm. if you can pick it up. Um, yeah. And if not, go to the leg that you can pick up and keep the session short so that you don't make the horse sore. You, you'd rather keep things short, walk the horse off or take him off the pad after you know 30 seconds, um, ra rather than leave him there a long time and find out the next day, uh oh, I shouldn't have done that long. Um, you can always do more, you can't undo what you've done. Yeah, and so. I've learned that the hard way, so. Uh, somebody, Ele Eleanor, I don't understand your question. You're saying, who is this guy in Australia again? Um, did we talk about somebody in Australia? So if you can clarify your question, I'll answer it, but I'm not sure I know what you're talking about. Um, in the meantime, I'm going to go to another video here. Do, do, do. So this is my fail. You can see that left front oh, yeah. that he he broke, and I he was 18 months after the fact coming to Dr. Marianne and I, and they weren't consistent in uh, the way they were showing that left front and see how he lands. Yeah, it crosses over so much. He's trying to keep the weight on that right front. And uh, so there wasn't anything much that I could do but to make him comfortable. And he chose through all of the trial and with all the pads, he liked the soft. And that's, I haven't done too many softs with other horses, but that's the one that he picked. So um, he, he's comfortable. Um, he's always going to be lame like that. and. But I actually, after I was work, I worked with him for, let's see, where's Charlie? I worked with him for about um, six months and he got better. Uh, not, not that an ed ed educated I couldn't see, but he was walking a little bit better I don't know if it was the pads or the farrier was doing a better job because there was some discussion with Dr. Marianne and the farrier about things needed to change because it wasn't working the way it was going. So yeah, um, and we and Brad of course brought me a little note. I was talking about David Butler. It's the Explain Pain, and he's uh, Noe Group. I put it in the chat there, so I didn't even remember what I said in two seconds. Um, you know, but this brings me to another thought that I had. Um, that we've seen Surefoot help horses with colic. Yes, um, and absolutely. there's been quite yes. a few cases. Um, and so have you had some of those? Yes. So um, some of you might have heard that 
Colorado was like 100 degrees on Saturday, and then we went to 30 degrees on Tuesday. And so um, that is a real trigger for colic for horses, that dramatic of a change. And we had one of our old guys that was looking pretty uncomfortable. And um, it was Rico, and he's 28. And uh, his digestive system hasn't been great his whole life. So um, it looked like we were on our way to some, maybe a colic issue, and we put him on the pads, and it went away. So, so cool. yeah. yeah. And, and, you know, the, the point being there is call your vet, but, you know, you got your pads. You, right. There's no harm. <laughs> um, but while we're waiting for the vet to arrive, we put him on the pads. And by the time the vet got here, he'd go, oh, I don't think I need to be here. So, <laughs> Which for a vet is a great idea, right? To come out and go, hey, you don't need me. Yay. Here's don't your, here's your barn go. visit charge. You know? <laughs> so, like, I get to go home to my dinner. <laughs> <laughs> um, um, but it's ha there's been so many cases now um, and you know there was one case that I was working with that he was colicking and we could use the, the physio pad to uh, alleviate some discomfort but in the end he had to be put down so there's another case where it was helping at least get to the point where he where the situation would be dealt with um, yeah. And so you might not always have the kind of outcome that you want, but if we can make the horses more comfortable during that phase while we're trying to get things sorted out for them, that's really important. You know, it's just, you know, it's, it's a great comfort that you can offer comfort to your horse. Horses can be so stoic that it's really hard to diagnose. Um, others are little snowflakes in their heart. It, they just, ah, I'm dying. <laughs> yes, I had one of those. <laughs> Yeah. my Andy horse but I loved him yeah. he was he got every skin thing okay here's another this is the one we're, we're uh, looking at from behind so suspensory this is um, Drew he's 10 year old warm blood he broke his um, catranter bone in his left hind and chronic soreness in his SI joint um big solid horse yeah big guy and so <clears throat> this is just one of the this is the before see how he's traveling yeah i don't think i have an after video of him though oh shoot uh i i think hang on i'll just stop sharing i'll go i'll go see if i have an after video of him um, but in the meantime, just talk about him. Well, um, he's still under our care, Dr. Marianne I's care, and um, he's back to light riding. So, oh, cool. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Um, so that's pretty cool because no more dressage because it um, is too uh, impactful on his joints, but light riding. <clears throat> um, and so how long has he been in rehab? Uh, I didn't put a date on this. I'm going to say a year and a half. Wow. Okay. Yeah. So that's your example of some horses take longer while well, other horses it's less time. Yeah. yeah. It, and, you know, the sooner, again, the sooner we can start picking up on some of these things that are, they're, they're, the damage is being done over time. And, um, the more I talk to veterinarians about um, tendon injuries, like deep digital test uh, flexor tendon and stuff, it's it's chronic. It's been being damaged over time, and then finally it just can't take it anymore. And then there's an acuteness to the injury. But the more we can start to pick things things up sooner and um, have better care in terms of feet and you know shoeing and saddle fit and all that, the and also, you know, so many riders pick up on the lameness of their horse, but they're, um, and I'm not saying in your vet's case, but in a lot of it, you know, my horse doesn't feel right, is the first comment an owner will make. My horse yeah. just doesn't feel right. But it's like your car, right? And you take it to the service guy and you say, there's this funny noise in my car. And he drives it around for an hour and goes, I can't find the funny noise, right? And we're like, we get back in the car and there's, there's that funny noise again. So um, do trust your gut on that. And um, you know that but that's where 
Well, I can't say that Surefoot's diagnostic. I can say that many times I've seen signs of things when I go to use Surefoot with a horse. And I'm sure, Amy, you've seen that. You go to pick up one foot and it's like, absolutely not, I can't give you that foot. Or you do pick up the foot and they stand on the pad in an interesting way. Right, and that's my biggest tell if they won't pick up that foot. Yeah. Um, because the, the owner will say, well, they always pick up their feet. And I go, okay, that's my tell. <laughs> Yeah, on on where the, you know which leg they're sore in for sure. And now whether it's in the shoulder, or, right, or further down, <clears throat> that's that's not my job to figure that out. That's the vet. Um, and there is a difference between and a horse knows this when you're going to pick up the feet to clean them out or or do something to the foot itself, and when you're picking up the leg to put it on sure foot pad because we come in with an ask instead of a tell. We're, we're, we're not pushing them off the weight off the shoulder or anything like that. We're just asking, can you give me this foot? And when it's approached with that question, that's a very different question than I'm gonna clean your foot out, give you your foot. Yeah. Um, yeah. We have another video here. Where did it go? Is it this one? Oh, I think it's this one. Yeah. Oh, this, this is um, that EPM horse again. Oh, okay. Rango. So uh, the ears, the radar ears are going like crazy. There's a little swallow and look at the ears and how much attention he's paying to his hindquarters, right? He yeah. gets a little distracted there, but then you can see how much he's thinking back toward his rear end. That's really fascinating. I'm going to just... I'll play it again, but I'll slow it down so that people can see that. So there's his ears going back and you can see him thinking about something and his ear came forward for the hand, right? Yeah, yeah. but he's, he, he really was concentrating on what's going on back here. Yep, and then a tiny distraction there, no problem. Oops, grab my little slider there. And, but it instantly his ears start coming back and it's, he's really curious. So, you know, and here's a horse where it's more subtle the, the signs are more subtle. It's a lot of ears twiggling around. We don't necessarily see a lot of swaying or anything, but he is on the physio pads, which are the most stable. Um, and it definitely has his attention. So, you know, so often it's the, the, you know, you'll see these little tiny signs that you don't necessarily always see the big overt yawning signs and things like that. Right. Yeah. That people, you know, that have know a little bit about surefoot. A lot of times they're looking for that. And well, why isn't my horse yawning or licking and chewing? And I said, well, but look at the uh, the carotid artery. His heart rate is increasing. Or look at his breaths. And he's taking some real shallow breaths, and then all of a sudden he kind of, kind of goes like that. And uh, so he's processing so much during the the surefoot that. Sometimes they don't know enough to let go with a lick and chew or yawn or some, some other dramatic swaying or some things like that. So, yeah. And so each horse is really unique and it's like there's a bell curve. We, we see the, a lot of common signs, the licking and chewing, head lowering, eye blinking, yawning, um, breathing. But, you know, there's, there's all these, just like people, you know, there's some that are much more stoic or self-reserved and others that are much more expressive. And, um, and you see that with horses and their ability to, and also their education level. Some horses have never felt anything like this. So they're not even sure what to do with that information. It's, it's kind of surprising. Um, you know, Amy, I, I still think about the two horses you brought to the workshop last last year, the gray mare and the um, gated horse. So I'd love yeah. you to talk about them because I, I don't get the story quite right. <laughs> <laughs> well, the, the little Palomino mare, um, she was a gated horse and um, pretty bothered when she came in, pretty reactive. And when uh, I brought her in, she, she would stand with her chest so far forward and that she she would lead with her chest before her front feet would move and by the time we were done because i was loading and unloading her on the trailer and she would about fall out of the trailer because she'd lead with the front end and i hadn't backed her out i was leading her straight out and by the time we were done and it was only what was that practitioner's clinic three it was days two days two days. two days well the second day she walked out 
and didn't fall out on her face for the, you know, so we did one session and she walked out. Um, and she got much more balanced, was able to gate better for her owner. And um, it just, uh, it was just a success from, from the first day. I was thinking it was three days, but if it was just two. It was then, two days, yeah. And she had come from West Virginia, right? Yes, she had. And, she, and what I remember of her was that she was what I would call a not very well-educated horse. No. She, she hadn't been taught much. She'd been probably just coerced into doing whatever she had to do and, and not a lot of attention pay, paid to her tack or anything like that. Any, not a lot of attention paid to her being comfortable. But the story I remember, Amy, was that after the first day, because we worked with her loose in a square pen, um, yeah. the, the Arab mayor in the round pen, and we had her in a square pen, and I just went in and worked with her in there. And it wasn't, what, 20 minutes uh, total. Um, mm -hmm. But the next morning when you went to catch her, because you couldn't catch that horse. Right. You remember yeah. that? Yes. The next morning. She, did, she, had, uh, she had been in for training for a while. Could, hard to catch. She just didn't think the human was worth a darn. But that next, the Sunday, or no, the next yeah, it was day. A, yeah, the next day. Yeah, that's right. It wasn't a Sunday. Yeah, gone in um, to catch her, and she caught me. She, she looked up at me and said, I'm ready to go. Whatever. I liked what we did yesterday. Let's do it again. Yep. So and Amy she, hadn't even worked with the pads with her. I was the only one, I think, because of the time no. I just messed with her. And, um, yeah. and, that, and it went, she was so different when she came back the next day. She was just like, that was really interesting. And then we had other people work with her on the second day. It was really fun. And then your gray mare is another, another horse that uh, sticks in my mind so well. Well, uh, and unfortunately, we did lose her to colleague. So, oh. but um, yeah, it's pretty sad. Yeah, <laughs> she was our. She belonged to us, and we had raised her and sold her as a weanling to a client friend. A client friend uh, needed to sell her, and we've asked people when we sell a horse if we have could have first right of refusal. So she contacted us, and we bought her back, and. Um, in her training process, and it hadn't been with us, but with whomever, um, it, the mayor was always telling me, uh, you're, what are you gonna do to me, not with me? And so she was very suspicious of the human and um, took her to the clinic and she was loose in the round pin and she wasn't sure about those pads to begin with, she didn't think you know, she said, it's one of those things you're going to do to me. But once she kind of figured those pads out, she started to hunt them up and look for them. And her whole demeanor changed. She went from being suspicious of, and another one hard to catch where she started catching me. I'd go out there and she'd come up hunting me and saying, Ooh, let's go do that again. And um, so things, you know, things improved dramatically for her and her mental well being. So yeah, it was such a contrast to have these two horses because the gray mare was clearly well educated. She yes. she was well trained and well educated, but you know something had happened where her her um, she became suspicious and decided that we weren't such great things to be around. Um, yeah. Whereas the 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 gated horse was uneducated and just wasn't you know we didn't offer anything to her that she knew of that was going to be nice but it, it was so interesting to work with these two horses because the educated horse the gray mare once she once she understood that we weren't going to make her do this that right. it was an offer to her she had a choice in yeah she just got onto that train so fast and the next day she was like almost telling us hey, okay now do this and do this. <laughs> yeah to, kind of an Arabian thing to do, right? Yeah, but she was so cool. And the other horse was kind of like, um, naive is probably the best word, Ig uh, ignorant in that she wasn't educated and naive. And she was kind of like, I don't know why I like you, but I, you know, that kind of a big question mark, like, I don't get it, but this was kind of interesting. And so can I do this again? But I'm not really sure what we're doing. And it was just, it was so nice to have those two horses. And yeah. I, and Amy had purposely not done pads with them so that she could bring them to the workshop, which I'm so grateful for because they, I, I wish we'd videoed that because it made some of the best demonstrations so far. It was just a blast. Yeah. 
really, really fun. Well, Amy, this has been such a pleasure to have you on and to listen to what you're doing. And I, I'm so excited about this connection that you've made with Mary, Dr. Marion and how this is working out because I'd really like to see this as a, as a possible model for the way other surfer practitioners can work with veterinarians in their area so that you know, to the benefit of the horse and the horse owner, we can really get these horses back on track and comfortable and working again. And so um, I just- yeah, I'm Dr. Mary and I, with Wendy's permission, because I asked this week, are gonna do, Dr. Marion's working on her PhD in sports rehab and medicine. She, like, she's so stupid because she has like three doctorates already, but, um, <laughs> uh, so we're going to use the surefoot pads in her doctorate study. So, so exciting. Um, we're really excited to see how that goes. Yeah. So my, I, I can't wait. So stay yeah. tuned for that one. I'm sure we'll get an update. Maybe we'll get Dr. Marion on when she finishes her research and have her talk to us about it. Absolutely. She'd love to do that. That'd be so awesome. Thanks everybody for that was here. And um, thank you so much, Wendy. You've changed my life and my horse's lives. And we oh, are forever grateful. Well, and you know, Amy, for me, the, the gift is mutual because now you are out there helping so many horses and it's, you know, I, I know I can't be everywhere and it's so nice to have someone like you out there that I know is doing great work and helping. So um, whether or not we talk to yeah. each other very often, it's, I still know you're out. Yeah, I love it. From the day one, I could see the changes and now my husband's on board. And so, That's so cool. Um, <laughs> <laughs> yeah 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 because he so can cool. see the changes he the extra set of eyes is pretty cool and yeah 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 so yep. thank you so much oh you're welcome all right everybody thanks for joining us just remember to subscribe to the surefoot equine youtube channel we'll be back next week with a webinar on uh i've forgotten who was on monday um but then I'm taking a vacation from the 16th to the 30th of, of October, uh, 30th of September. We'll be back that first week in October on the Monday. So you'll get to catch up on the webinars and just have a great weekend. And we'll see when you see you on Monday. Thanks a lot. Thanks, Amy. Thank you. Bye. Thank you, Daddy. Bye.